Hi everyone, this is Ben and welcome to My Shiny Toolbox. During our travels this past summer, I had to replace both batteries in Mary Jane and it was a serious lesson learned. The situation we found ourselves in is embarrassing considering my education and training as a nuclear engineer. It's something I should have seen coming, but I failed to recognize the seriousness of our situation until it was too late. And I basically allowed the camper's converter, which is the system that changes 110 volts AC from shore power into 12 volts DC to destroy two perfectly good batteries. Before I go too far, let me say that there was absolutely nothing wrong with the converter or its ability to charge the batteries. The fact that the charging system basically cooked the batteries was totally my fault, but I believe I've come up with a solution that should prevent me from ever having to worry about an overcharged battery in the future. To help you understand how I got myself in this situation, let me briefly describe how I store Mary Jane between road trips. After we unload and clean her up, we store our camper on some property outside of town where a friend of mine has graciously allowed us to install what some folks call a pole barn. I call it a carport, but each to his own. The building is three-sided with a roof and provides pretty good shelter from most of the elements. Once she's inside, my habit has always been to install the chocks, lock the hitch, and just before I lock the door, press the red battery disconnect on the switch panel just inside the door. Pressing this switch causes all the lights, the multiplex control panel, and the radio, if it was on, to turn off. Now, this all sounds intuitive and seems to be a pretty good course of action when storing your camper. It is not good practice for the life of your batteries to allow them to discharge while in storage and Airstream seems to have made it relatively easy to keep your batteries from fully discharging. Upon further investigation, and I'm sure I read this early on after purchasing Mary Jane, Airstream has the following to say about that blessed little switch on page 8-26 of the owner's manual. Question 6. What is the battery disconnect switch function? Answer. It is a switch that disengages or engages the 12 volt power supply from the house batteries to everything but the liquid propane gas detector. The switch is used to cut power when the trailer is not being used or put into storage to preserve battery charge. However, that's all the owner's manual has to say regarding the battery disconnect switch. Pretty straightforward, eh? Well, not so much. As it turns out, that little liquid propane gas detector pulls enough current such that if you leave your camper idle and disconnected from any power source, the batteries will discharge. A lot. Because this was my normal practice, using only the battery disconnect switch, the batteries would discharge to the point that I eventually had to connect a 7-pin cable to the truck and use the truck's 12-volt system before I could raise or lower the camper using the power jack. Even then, it didn't hit me that I might be doing bad things to one or more cells of the batteries. Now, fast forward to the second week of July this past summer. My wife and I are enjoying a beverage or two at a small campground near Hagerstown, Maryland, with emphasis on small, we were really stacked up next to our neighbors. We both began noticing the lovely aroma we've all experienced when one of our camping neighbors is dumping their black tank. Yay. So we decided to finish our G&Ts inside and carry on living and loving the simple life. Now, fast forward again about a week to Cooperstown, New York, where we found a lovely KOA operated well outside the town in the middle of Amish country hardly a soul around in some of the biggest individual lots we've experienced in our years of camping. I highly recommend this KOA if you haven't been yet. Cooperstown KOA Journey, and that's on 565 Ostrander Road in Richfield Springs, New York. It was our first evening there and we were again enjoying the cool summer breeze coming off the freshly plowed fields behind our campground when we were both struck with that same odor. You know what I mean. That acrid, rotten egg sort of smell that usually means only one thing. The confusing thing was there was no one near us. We were on the end of a row and no next door neighbor. But we were in the middle of Amish country and having grown up on and around farms, I knew that natural fertilizer is usually pretty abundant. So I still didn't think much of it. 
On our third day in the Cooperstown KOA, the odor was finally too much to attribute to a careless neighbor or natural farming practices. It had to be coming from our rig. I sniffed around a bit, which I later realized was a bad idea, and noticed the odor was coming from the front of the camper. I finally found the source when I opened the battery box lid and could actually hear the batteries boiling. All right, now, where was I? So, third day, sniffed around. Oh yeah, here. I finally found the source when I opened the battery box lid and could actually hear the batteries boiling and feel heat coming off their surfaces. This was a bad, bad situation. I remembered then I had been hearing the cooling fan for the converter running for an inordinate amount of time, which is what it's supposed to do when it's being tasked to run more than normal. See, when your battery voltage is low, say 10.5 volts DC, the converter turns on a certain part of its system to send current to the battery. Eventually, assuming a healthy battery, the voltage felt by the battery will rise to a point where the charging part of the converter turns off while it continues supplying 12 volt DC to the rest of the camper. The problem was I had allowed the batteries to discharge over and over far below 12 volts. Then each time I hooked up to shore power, the converter would send power back to the batteries in an attempt to bring them back to 12 volts. Doing this several times caused a number of individual cells within each battery to fail. With bad cells, a 12 volt battery can never be recharged back to 12 volts. Since the converter could not sense a high enough voltage, it saw no reason to turn off the charging part of the system and continued sending current into the batteries. Now, lead acid batteries use sulfuric acid as the acid part, but if too much energy is pumped back into the batteries, the sulfuric acid begins to break down. In my case, the batteries overheated to the point where they began producing hydrogen sulfide, which is where the rotten egg smell came from. Hydrogen sulfide is produced naturally in wastewater treatment facilities and sometimes found in swampy areas or where fossil fuels are being mined. It is a very dangerous gas if inhaled over an extended time. Here's a report if you're interested in the biological effects, but it ain't good. My wife and I are very lucky. This is one of the main reasons, in my humble opinion, that camper batteries are installed outside the people tank. Well, very serious lesson learned. To prevent ruining batteries in the future, I decided to install disconnects between the batteries and the rest of the camper. My first effort, though effective, looked like this. The only thing missing from this spaghetti junction was marinara sauce. I also realized the flaw in the original design of the battery installation by Airstream when I tried to complete the 60-day scheduled maintenance. You can check that out on my three video series I have on Facebook and YouTube, which included checking the battery's water level. If you look closely at this mess, you'll see there's no way to get to the battery caps without removing all the cables. My marine style disconnects didn't help matters. So I put my engineering cap back on and decided I was going to solve both problems at once. Clean up the mess inside the battery box and install beefy disconnects that would allow me to electrically isolate the batteries from the 12 volt system when I'm not using them. Here are the parts I used. Two 60 amp air conditioner disconnects, a length of four gauge wire, about 12 feet, four gauge ring terminals to connect to the ends of the batteries, two-sided Gorilla brand mounting tape, eight one quarter inch nylon bolts, washers, and nuts. Now I chose nylon to prevent any galvanic reactions between the battery box and the disconnect box, both of which are metals that might be dissimilar to a metal bolt and nut. Plus the disconnect box is very light, so doesn't need a lot of vertical support. 
So here are the before and after pictures of the inside of my battery box. The first is with the marine style disconnects installed. The second is after I finished installing the air conditioner style disconnects. Just to give you an idea of how much cleaner the box is with the new cables installed. It also shows that I have access to the water caps on top of the battery so that I can do the 60 day maintenance without disconnecting a whole bunch of stuff that might be in the way. This is what I consider an advanced installation for the average do-it-yourselfer. If you'd like to see a step-by-step -step procedure on how I installed these switches, please see my video titled Battery Disconnect Switches Installation Instructions. What I've installed on Mary Jane works well, and I think I've solved the problem of minimizing battery discharge while in storage. One final note, the whole reason for my installing this on our camper is to minimize the battery drain while it's in storage. And again, the reason for the battery drain is that our, there are still components using 12 volt DC even after the factory installed battery disconnect is used. Most notably, the liquid propane gas detector remains energized in case of a liquid propane leak. However, in my opinion, the function of that detector is to alarm us if we're in the camper and probably asleep and a liquid propane leak occurs. If Mary Jane is in storage, no one is in the camper to hear the alarm, even if there was a liquid propane leak. So my practice is to shut both liquid propane bottle valves as part of the storage. Any liquid propane that could possibly leak after that is going to be outside and will dissipate into the air. In either case, a leak inside or outside, no one is living in Mary Jane while she's in storage, so I see no reason to have the alarm energized. Well, thanks for watching. I hope this has been informative and that if you have any comments or questions regarding this, I'm happy to share my experience with you, so please give me a shout. Here's wishing everyone a great day. I'm Ben, and this has been My Shiny Toolbox.